Welcome to the second of our three videos of worship for Sunday the 13th of February 2022 from St Luke's Church, Eccleshill. In this video, Linda is going to speak to us about the Bible reading. Good morning. Some of you listening to today's reading may have thought that this reading sounded very much like Matthew's version of the Sermon on the Mount, which is 107 verses long. Here in Luke's Gospel, we heard Jesus giving a 32 verse sermon known as the Sermon on the Plain. But Luke puts a slightly different spin on it to Matthew. When Jesus went down the mountainside with his disciples, he found a crowd made up of people who'd come to hear all he had to say, hear him teach and heal, and they'd come from towns up to a hundred miles away. Jesus spoke directly to the disciples, even though the others were listening, and goes on to describe a short list of positive and negative statements, which Luke describes as blessings and woes. The four blessings are for the poor, the hungry, the woes that weep, those who are excluded and those who are persecuted. I've often thought that to be poor or hungry, to weep, be excluded or persecuted couldn't possibly be a blessing. So where was Jesus coming from? Now his disciples would have known that there were long lists of blessings for those who obeyed the law and curses for those who didn't in the book of Deuteronomy, all of which had formed a binding agreement between God and Israel. Now, Jesus wanted to teach his version of the blessings, which would be an upside down code of the rules everybody else knew at the time. Although I do think that Jesus might have said that his words were the right way up code. Jesus wanted his disciples and possibly all who were listening to understand that God was doing something new. So they needed a new code of practice. It wasn't blessed to be poor, to be hungry, to weep or be persecuted and excluded, but it was blessed for all those types of people to be accepted in God's kingdom. And that's something we need to remember as well. All people are accepted and loved by God. In the times when Jesus walked this earth, most people would have thought that only the rich and the well-fed, the happy and the admired were accepted and loved by God. Even in our times, don't some people think that others are more worthy than them and find it difficult to believe that they are truly the blessed ones of God? Yet throughout the Gospels, we can read of how much time Jesus spent with the poor, with the outcast, with the ill, with the loveless and the suffering. We've read all along of Jesus acting with love and compassion towards all he met. It's something that not many people in our world have ever been able to do. We've read of Jesus proclaiming that he'd come to fulfil Isaiah's prophecy and bring good news to the poor, on that disastrous time in Nazareth when Jesus' message wasn't taken very well. Here again in this sermon on the plain, Jesus wants to assure the lowest of the low that they are blessed by God. This was how Jesus saw God's kingdom. Jesus wanted his disciples to behave as he did and to understand that everyone was important to God. We, as his modern day followers, well, we need to also reach out to those who are poor and hungry. And we can do it in different ways, whether volunteering at the food bank or picking up bags of food at Morrison's to be sent to the food bank or giving to charity. We can offer comfort to those who weep by reaching out with phone calls, cards, visits and offering friendship and care that sometimes gives away to laughter. To make sure we never exclude any type of people from our church or our homes. 
Those are some ways that we can live the blessings that Christ teaches. Then if that wasn't challenge enough, Jesus followed on with four opposite statements he called the woes. The woes, which are unique to Luke's gospel, are tough ones to hear, particularly if we find that they describe ourselves. A man named Eugene Peterson, an American pastor, was so troubled that people in his congregation didn't truly understand a lot of the Bible, that he ended up writing and translating the Bible in a book called The Message. Eugene had taught both Hebrew and Greek, so was eminently qualified as a translator of the Bible. He never intended that his translated Bible would replace other well-known translations of the Bible. He, he just intended to help people get reading the Bible more easily using language in a more contemporary nature. The message. Well, it certainly helped me come to terms with the meaning of those woes, which he translated this way. Number one, but it's trouble ahead if you think you have it made. What you have is all you'll get. Number two, and it's trouble ahead if you are satisfied with yourself. Yourself will not satisfy you for long. Three, and it's trouble ahead if you think life's all fun and games. There's suffering to be met and you're going to meet it. Four, there's trouble ahead when you live only for the approval of others, saying what flatters them, doing what indulges them. Popularity contests are not truth contests. Look how many scoundrel preachers were approved by your ancestors. Your task is to be true, not popular. Well, the woes can clearly be seen to have not been too popular with anybody listening at that time. Even not very popular with some of the disciples who probably found them a bit too difficult to take on board. Jesus wanted to shock people, to stop them being complacent, to stop resting on their laurels and really think about what God's kingdom should look like. It's the woes that stick most in my mind, especially two of them. Number one, and it's trouble ahead if you're satisfied with yourself. Yourself will not satisfy you for long. I think that's true for our society today. Being satisfied with yourself might seem an okay thing to do, at least we wouldn't be thinking that we were better than other people. Perhaps James and John might have taken note of this woe when they asked Jesus who was the greatest. But being satisfied with oneself might make us resistant to change as lots of us want a comfortable life. It might make us wary of trying out new things, scared of treating others in a truly Christian manner, as others might make fun of us, and the other world. And it's trouble ahead if you think life's all fun and games. There's suffering to be met, and you're going to meet it. So many of us complain, don't we, when we're suffering. When we're suffering with anything from bitter toothache, or to having many more serious complaints. We ask, why me? Why am I the one that's suffering? I've even known some rather new Christians to give up altogether once they've had to suffer in any way. And yet that lesson is quite clear from the teaching of Jesus. We will all suffer at some time in our lives. Some more than others. Being a Christian doesn't mean everything in the garden will be rosy. What God does want us to understand is that he will always be with us, no matter what we are experiencing. When Jesus gave this sermon on the blessings and the woes, he knew it was going to be unpopular with people. 
It was going to upset a lot of people. It would provoke opposition from people who liked things the way they were. That's like we are sometimes. Jesus' message of promise and warning of blessings and curses would have reminded some people of their prophets of old who'd warned them many times of their wrongdoing and what would happen if they carried on like that. Jesus knew that many would react against him in the same way as people reacted against the prophets in the past. Does that mean there's no hope for the rich, the admired, the comfortable? Well, Jesus is crystal clear that riches and worldly prestige create major obstacles to being part of God's kingdom. But he also said at another time that it's impossible, that what is impossible for us is possible for God. And of course, it's never too late to change. So what are his promises and warnings for us here in Eccles Hill today, for people who hear his call and follow him? Well, I suppose we all need to answer that for ourselves. Will we take heed of the warnings Jesus gave those people all those years ago? After all, we are part of the same human race. Will we remember that God's kingdom is one which turns the world upside down or perhaps the right way up as much as it ever did. My prayer for us is that we will take heed of the things Jesus said and we will all find the faith and the strength to follow Jesus in the best way we can. Let's pray. Dearest Lord, please help us to love in our very small way what you love infinitely and everywhere. Help each one of us stand for love, for healing, for the good and the acceptance of all your people here on earth. Amen. Years ago, the Christian Church expressed its faith by drawing up a document called the Apostles' Creed. Let's say it together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. That's the end of the second of these three videos of worship, but to follow us into the third, in which we spend quite a bit of time praying, please just again choose it when it appears on the screen after I've finished speaking, and we'll see you there.